Welcome to the Thunderbolts.info podcast for November 12th, 2012. We bring you all the latest news, information, and analysis from the electric universe, shedding new light on the many mysteries that dark theories have yet to illuminate. Today on our program, we have a real privilege for all of the people who have discovered and explore this great inquiry called the electric universe. I've grown to really love hearing the personal stories of individuals who come from every imaginable background, from professional scientists to curious laypersons who, like myself, were never trained in the sciences, and yet we still seek an understanding of how things actually work in the universe. Well, today on the show, We're going to be speaking with a gentleman who certainly is qualified in the academic sense to offer analysis and criticism of the conventional mathematical models of the universe that have guided mainstream astronomy and physics for generations. Dr. Jeremy Dunning Davies is here today, and he has been going on about five years now, a good friend and colleague of the Thunderbolts Project. And before I bring Jeremy on, I'd like to briefly read to you a short excerpt from an article that he authored around 2008. He writes, I was initially trained as a mathematician, although my degree did involve two years of subsidiary physics. Over the years, I have come to realize more and more the power of mathematics, but also the fact that that power can be misused. Mathematics is a beautiful subject and can be studied in its own right as a highly worthwhile intellectual pursuit. However, mathematics has a second role as the language of physics. And in that role, it is simply a tool which must always remain subservient to the physics. If the mathematics throw up a result which does not accord with physical reality. It should be studied carefully, but not accepted immediately unless a genuine physical interpretation can be found. The physics must never be made to fit the mathematics. And how true and how relevant those comments are today to our exploration of the electric universe. Dr. Jeremy Dunning Davies, welcome to the show today. Thanks very much. Now, Dr. Dunning Davies, um, I was describing your background in my introduction. And so I have to ask, how is it that someone with your background ended up at the front doorstep of the Thunderbolts project, actively inquiring about the electric universe? I think it, I was interested in what you, in the comment you read out um, that I'd written some few years ago, because I think that the origin of my present attitude actually goes back to when I went to Cardiff University in South Wales to study for my PhD and I was in the department of what was then called applied maths and mathematical physics and I started off uh, and my supervisor was the the professor and head of department man called Peter Landsberg and he gave me something to do I can't remember what it was and I, I went away and did it and One night, I I wrote it up very, very neatly and very carefully underlined the result in red to indicate that that was the final result. And I came in the the following day to see Peter Landsberg, and I was really pleased with this, and I handed it to him, and he looked through, and yes, yes, that's all right. And then he he came to the final results, and he, he looked up at me, and he said, what does it mean physically? And I was completely taken aback for the moment that somebody should ask this question. And um, before I had a chance to really collect my thoughts, he, he, he really had a go at me. And if I leave out all the expletives that went with it, <laughs> what I actually said was, um, what's the use of this result if, if, if you don't know what it means physically? And that small incident, I am convinced, has actually colored the rest of my academic life. It had a, a really profound effect on me. Wow. I, I've I don't think I've always lived up to it, but I've tried to. And yes, I think that's the origin of it. That's what 
it was that one little incident that really changed my whole outlook. And, and it also made me question more. Because as an, as an undergraduate, I think in my final year, the topic I absolutely loved most was relativity, special and general. And looking back now, I realized there were lots of results there that I just accepted. Because to me, the mathematics involved was beautiful. And this is the danger. And it's the danger we're facing today, that people get wrapped up with some mathematics. And they think, oh, this is beautiful mathematics. And they, for some ridiculously unknown reason, go on and say, therefore, it must have a physical meaning. And they try to put a physical meaning to things. I think one area where this is probably true, having talked to a few practitioners in the area, is this area of string theory. Because I've talked to, well, I've talked to a few friends of my daughters who um, are maths graduates, and um, they've gone on to do research in string theory. And they, one, one of them actually said to me, um, well, I'm only doing, I, I'm just interested in maths. I couldn't care less whether this has got any physical applications or not. And I said to him, I said, well, fair enough. I, that attitude, as far as I'm concerned, is fine. But uh, it's when some people then take something, such as string theory, and start to say, oh, but it has this meaning physically, it has that meaning physically. And they're forcing it to have the meaning. And this is where the real danger comes in. You've got to look at the, uh, at the physics of the situation and then worry about the maths. If you go back in history, what Birkeland did was to carry out experiments and do a lot of observations and come up with some suggestions. What Sidney Chapman, the, the English geophysicist, did was to come up with a mathematical theory and from that make some suggestions. Now it turned out that at the time, because there was some elegant maths from Chapman, that was accepted as being the truth. But reality is, Birkeland was correct, Chapman was wrong. Now we found that out with more recent um, satellite explorations, but it's never actually been really made public that this is the case. And this highlights to me the real danger that we face with, with mathematics in physics. You've right. got to realize what its position is and keep it there. Uh-huh. Very well said. Now, it might come as a surprise to some proponents of the standard cosmology that the Thunderbolts project is in regular communication with professional scientists, physicists, astronomers, mathematicians. And the feedback that I know our administrators often get is we cannot sit down and seriously consider your theory until you give us the mathematical modeling. And you're saying, though, that that was not a problem for you, and it didn't prevent you from considering the electric universe theory. Well, no. I mean, why should it? They've got it the wrong way around. Look, whether people agree with the electric universe theories or not, if, if they look at them and they're willing to look at them, if mathematicians look at them, it's up to them to provide the maths. They're saying to you, oh, but you've got to justify this by giving a mathematical theory. Well, we don't, we don't justify what happens in everyday life in the, in the universe, in, in, in nature and everything, because there's a mathematical theory. We justify it because we see it. We know it's happening. So it's then up to the, it's then up to the mathematicians to come up with their model. And that's all they ever come up with. They don't come up with reality. They come up with a model. And they use mathematical techniques whether it be algebra or calculus or what have you, they use these mathematical techniques to manipulate symbols within that model. And they hope to make um, some recommendations, some suggestions of what um, might actually happen, make some predictions in the model. But it's still a model. But when we look outside, when people from the electric universe um, look up into the heavens, they look up and they see an actual physical event occurring. Now, it's there. Now, they are offering an explanation which takes into account, basically takes into account electromagnetic forces. The people that are opposing them are looking at a model, which, and that's all it is, 
but it's a model based purely on gravitational forces. Now, it doesn't matter that the electromagnetic force is so much stronger than the gravitational force, in my view. What is important is we've got here two forces. We know they both operate in nature. Whether gravitation is a result of electromagnetism or not, let's forget that for the moment. We've got the gravitational force, we've got the electromagnetic force. They're both out there operating. You cannot come up with a sensible model which is based on one to the total exclusion of the other. The electric universe is bringing the electromagnetic force to the fore, and it's up to these mathematicians themselves to say, oh, let's look at this, let's see if we can put the mathematics to this. It's not up to them to turn around to the electric universe people and say, ah, well, we, we can't believe this until you have produced the mathematics. Is that, that's a rubbish argument. You know, I don't think I've ever heard it put quite in those terms. And I, I sincerely take my hat off to you for that. And you're talking about the Big Bang theory, black hole theory, dark matter, dark energy. That is what the mathematical approach has left us with. And so when you're looking out at the conventional viewpoint of the universe, does anything come to mind immediately as to the failures of the standard model to actually predict and explain what we do see in the heavens? Well, let's leave prediction for, to one side for the moment, Michael, because when I look at the conventional model and everything in it, it seems to me that it's all based on one or more mathematical singularities. Now, when I was uh, a boy in school, we were always taught that a mathematical singularity, any singularity, was where the theory broke down. Not, you didn't try to give it a physical explanation. But they're, they're based on these singularities. And when they're telling the electric universe people, you produce the mathematics, I think you can turn back to them and say, well, look, as far as black holes are concerned, the boots on the other foot. Why don't you produce the correct mathematics? Because if you pick up any book on general relativity, you will find them talking about the so-called Schwarzschild solution to Einstein's field equations. And in almost any book on general relativity, you'll have the same equation giving this solution. And that equation has a possible mathematical singularity in it, and it is that singularity which leads to the apparent, and I hear speak in inverted commas, physical um, object, a black hole. But if you actually go back to the original paper by Schwarzschild himself, there is no such singularity in it. What they are quoting as the Schwarzschild solution isn't. And it's as simple as that. Now, I'm not saying that Schwarzschild was correct, and that the solution they print is wrong. All I'm saying is they're not the same. And the one that is not due to Schwarzschild is the one which leads to black holes eventually. I've written on this uh, as, in fact, as Stephen Crothers. I mean, we, we corresponded about this. We've both written on it separately. But this very, very simple point, because all you've got to do is pick up two pieces of paper, look at the equation on the one in your left hand, and then glance across to the one on the paper in your right hand, and you'll see that they're different. And it's as simple as that. So what is the truth with them on their side? Right. Now, I have to take some personal accountability for the fact that we've not yet had Stephen J. Crothers on the show, although we certainly do intend to have him on, and we would love to have him on at some point before the conference in January of next year. So I know that you have looked at his analysis and so I assume based on your comments that you've come to the conclusion that essentially his criticism of the internal mathematical reasoning behind black holes is correct. I've looked at some of it, Michael, but I, I can't honestly say I've been through all of it, but I have looked at some. I agree with him on certainly a, a, a large portion of this, of the material. Right. And this is the basic one. The, the point I've just highlighted about the Schwarzschild solution, in, in many ways, that is the basic um, result that's causing, causing a lot of controversy with some people. And the controversy, of course, is being hushed up. You're not allowed to talk about it in public. Right. 
as you allude to, these scientific controversies, they are not treated as controversies necessarily in the mainstream scientific media. Many people in the general public are not aware that evidence exists, for instance, undermining or defying the Big Bang Theory, the notion of an expanding universe. There's the evidence presented by astronomers like Halton Arp and the Burbages suggesting that redshift is not a reliable indicator of distance. You have high redshift objects in close association with low redshift objects. Even su supposedly in front of them. In front of, exactly. And so that data is generally, I think it's attributed to... Actually, Michael, if I can just butt in there. Absolutely. I think, I think that the, that particular example gives the priceless explanation that they've offered. Because at one point, I mean, we know that there are uh, several examples. It's not just one. There are several examples where you've got an apparently high redshift object in front of a low redshift galaxy. And one of the explanations that's been seriously put forward is that in each and every case, there's actually a hole in the galaxy allowing you to see through it to the redshift object, high redshift object beyond it. Now, if you want to believe that. <laughs> you have a bridge to sell us. <laughs> well, <laughs> now, what about this, this whole notion? We see this infamous graph of 96% of the universe is invisible. It's dark matter, dark energy. They are presented as science fact in science media. We never see any real questioning in, this, in the scientific press releases and the science articles. So I'm just, I'm curious that with your background, have you encountered on a personal level other academics who have any kind of internal questioning of whether or not this whole ideology is actually correct? Oh, yes. There was a gentleman in Hull. Um, he was the professor of theoretical physics. And then they messed around the physics department and he switched to engineering. And then he retired, but he continued coming into the university. And I worked w with him for a very long time. And we published quite a lot of articles together. And this was a man called George Cole. Now, George really did question it. He was questioning relativity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he certainly questioned black holes and dark matter. And of course, at the Royal Astronomical Society, he introduced me to a, a man called Kenneth Thornhill. Now, Kenneth Thornhill, they're both dead, of course, now. But I mean, Kenneth um, w was a, another inspiration to me. Um, I only ever met him once, and we, we, we just had numerous, very long telephone conversations. But Kenneth Thornhill, when he graduated, he was offered a job at Bristol University over here as a lecturer, and he actually turned it down. And the grounds on which he turned it down were that if he had accepted the job, he would have had to lecture on relativity. And since he believed relativity wrong, he couldn't, in all honesty, accept the job. And so he worked for all his life in the uh, Ministry of Defense, but he, he published, and you can find some of his articles online. And of course, he was regarded as sort of persona non grata. People might talk to him, but they wouldn't pay any attention to him. And he was a very bright man. And I mean, you, you've mentioned the classic example of where somebody was honest to their science and was hammered for it, and that's Halton Art. All people need to know is the story of Halton Arp, and they will see immediately how disgusting some of the activities within science are. Well, Jeremy, I hope that what you are doing and the kind of discussion we're having today will serve as an invitation to other scientists uh, to be more internally skeptical and to at least open a door of consideration to the electric universe. Well, let's face it, Michael, if they're not willing to do that, they're not true scientists. Very well said. Well, look, Jeremy, we unfortunately are coming to the end of our time here today. The time has just flown by. Um, I hope we can do this again in the near future because, as I said, you have a, a unique voice. You come from a unique position and everything that you have to say on the state of standard cosmology and your willingness to consider the electric universe Every person who is interested in this inquiry 
should be very interested in what you have to say. And I just, I really thank you for taking the time to do this. And I know that um, the efforts that you're making, they're just, they're only going to be beneficial for the Thunderbolts project. Well, I certainly hope so, Michael. And may I thank you for asking me? And may I also say how, actually, I've enjoyed this little chat. And if ever you do want to have a second one, feel free anytime. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like a second and a third and a fourth. And I, we have no shortage of things happening in space and new data coming in that we'll be able to talk about. Well, I've got Skype now, so there's nothing to stop us. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Cheers, Michael. Thank you. And thank you, the audience, for joining us today. You can stay tuned to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Thunderbolts Project. And stay tuned to thunderbolts.info for all of the latest news and analysis from the Electric Universe. Thank you very much. Welcome to the thunderbolts.info podcast for November 12th, 2012. We bring you all the latest news, information, and analysis from the Electric Universe, shedding new light on the many mysteries that dark theories have yet to illuminate. Today on our program, we have a real privilege for all of the people who have discovered and explore this great inquiry called the Electric Universe. I've grown to really love beautiful subject and can be studied in its own right as a highly worthwhile intellectual pursuit. However, mathematics has a second role as the language of physics, and in that role, it is simply a tool which must always remain subservient to the physics. If the mathematics throw up a result which does not accord with physical reality, it should be studied carefully, but not except before I bring Jeremy on. I'd like to briefly read to you a short excerpt from an article that he authored around 2008. He writes, I was initially trained as a mathematician, although my degree did involve two years of subsidiary physics. Over the years, I have come to realize more and more the power of mathematics, but also the fact that that power can be misused. Mathematics is a who certainly is qualified in the academic sense, to offer analysis and criticism of the conventional mathematical models of the universe that have guided mainstream astronomy and physics for generations. Dr. Jeremy Dunning Davies is here today, and he has been going on about five years now, a good friend and colleague of the Thunderbolts Project, and of hearing the personal stories of individuals who come from every imaginable background, from professional scientists to curious laypersons who, like myself, were never trained in the sciences, and yet we still seek an understanding of how things actually work in the universe. Well, today on the show, we're going to be speaking with a gentleman 